Welcome to Flex Perspectives, where I interview the thought leaders, innovators, and executives shaping the future of flexible work. Flex Perspectives is brought to you by the Flex Index, the world's most robust source for full-time hybrid and remote work requirements. The Flex Index represents more than 6,500 companies, 45,000 office locations, and 100 million people. It's a great place to start if you're looking for your next flexible work career opportunity. Today, my guest is Hanyo Lin. Haniel is the CEO of Castle Systems International, an industry leader in managed security solutions. Castle is famous for its workplace occupancy barometer that tracks return to office levels relative to pre-pandemic. Today, we'll discuss Castle's journey through the pandemic, how the companies had to evolve to meet the changing nature of work, and how the workplace occupancy barometer became such an important data set in return to office tracking. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating. That helps new listeners find the podcast. Haniel, welcome. Thank you, Rob. Great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you and I have some funny similarities that we've talked about. We both studied at Penn. Uh, we both spent some of our early and formative career years in consulting. Um, what led you into consulting in the first place? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how funny the similarities are, but it's always uh, it's always nice to meet another alum who's walked the mean streets of Philly. I think that's always very cool. Um, I, I have great fondness from, for that school. Uh, I got my engineering degree there. I got my MBA there, went back to that school, and then I landed at McKinsey, as you, as you said. Um, and I, I, I guess when I, I remember looking back on it, I found looking forward at that time, but then now looking backwards, a couple of things that are really exciting about consulting, um, especially relative to industry when I was at GE in between business school and undergrad. I think one thing is you, you get to solve problems that the smartest, most progressive companies uh, in the world hire you to solve because they can't solve it themselves, which gives you a chance to really engage on really interesting issues uh, and to learn and to grow. At that point in my career, I thought that was a really cool thing to do. And then the other thing that I think is really interesting is at a very young age, you get to sit in front of CEOs of companies, uh, not because you get to, but because you're backed by, you know, Bain or MCK or whatever, that allows you to make recommendations that they would listen to uh, that otherwise it, they wouldn't. And, you know, if we had more time, I could tell you about how I wrote Jack Welch when I was at uh, GE and wrote him a letter about how you could improve the company. <laughs> a funny story, but That's for a great. different day. Um, but I, I kind of like this, this opportunity to see what things can, how things can get better and the opportunity to make recommendations and make companies better and consulting, I thought would give me the chance to do that. Yeah, I, I felt the same same way about my experience. It, it, the other thing that always jumps out to me is the speed at which you can learn new topics and consulting forces you to go zero to 60 on something really, really fast. And I, I found that to be valuable in a lot of different facets of business over yeah, time. Yeah, right. I, I always hear people say you give somebody first 100 days to onboard and by that time and the study is over. And so you, you only have 100 days. And so you kind of have to ramp in 30 days. And then I think that that's a really neat opportunity too. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so you started out or, or you started out of business school, I believe you said in at McKinsey, and then uh, you went over to corporate executive board and spent quite a long stint there, I believe. Yeah, I actually uh, from McKinsey, I did a startup uh, for about two and a half years or so between and then I went to CEB in 2001 after the startups you know, started to die down round it's one. It's good time to go out of startups too. <laughs> it's just it's up and down. It always shows up uh, that way. Yeah. So I, I did end up going to CEB. Um, and I'm sorry, you asked me a question. I, I missed what you I said. You, you spent 16 years there, I think, right? So it was quite a long stint. Tell me a little bit about what you did and, and where'd you focus on? Yeah, you know, so I was really lucky to found myself to that company because I was there from 100 million revenue to ultimately a billion dollars before we were bought by, um, by Gartner. And, and I, I did all sorts of things, but you could probably best describe it as general management which may be kind of opposite of any kind of specialization. So I, I started there running the product development group and then ultimately built and ran businesses from literally like zero dollars in revenue to when I left, I was the president of one of the businesses there that was about 600 and 650 or so million in revenue. Um, uh, probably the, the thing that I spent my the most amount of time at CEB doing where, where maybe I know slightly better than the other parts of it is uh, I ran the sales and marketing business, which is our set of products that we sold to heads of sales, heads of marketing, corporate communications, customer service. And I spent about seven years there. Um, and if you have come across ever the challenger sale or customer uh, effort score, um, those two bits of research came out of my time, our, you know, my team's time there in sales marketing. Um, uh, probably the best pieces of IP that we put out there. 
And so having a perspective on sales and marketing and service, I think was really helpful to me, at least as I've come into this job, but also having perspective on other companies and, and what they're doing and how to sell and how to serve better uh, and best practices in doing so. Yeah, that's pretty cool, actually. I didn't know that. And that's one I feel like one of the most canonical pieces of, uh, of sales methodology at this point. There are very few people in sales who are not familiar with it in some capacity. Yeah, and, and I, I remember when we brought it to, to market, when we brought it to our, we were calling them members, but basically our clients, uh, you always get this natural, like, what are you talking about? This makes no sense to me. And then next thing you know, it becomes the thing, right? So the what keeps you up at night question doesn't really make any sense anymore. Nobody has time to go and answer it from a buying selling standpoint. And that dance is, 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 is old fashioned. And then to come in with some insight about how you can teach somebody about their business that they didn't appreciate before has really become powerful, uh, a powerful mainstay, I think, of how you sell these days. It was really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you went to Castle, uh, that must have been, yeah, it's a pretty big change, I would think, from what you were doing at, at CEB and, and different size and scale of organization. What made that interesting or how did you find even that the opportunity at Castle? So, so I uh, I stayed at CEB for about eight months after the acquisition and after the transition settled, and uh, and you know I, I was looking for an opportunity I think to go run a company, uh, and I got called uh, for for Castle and and it was it was immediately interesting to me just because Castle's got such a reputation especially in DC which is uh, where where we are based or I am based. And everyone here has heard of Castle in some way, um, because we've been around for 50 years. We have the Castle Key, the Castle Card. It's a really, even though it's a B2B company, it's really well branded you know, to the credit of, of the founder, Ken Samberg. Better consumer awareness than most. Uh, than yeah, most I, I would say so, yeah. especially in our space in the, in the security, or maybe some people might even put us in the systems integration space. The consumer, the customer, the user is very far from the way that people think about it. And, and as a company, we've been thinking about that forever, again, much to the credit of the founder. And I had the, the good fortune to spend time with Mark Ein, who's the majority owner of the company. And, and he and I talked about the opportunity to grow and scale a business. And if you go back to the probably uh, most interesting experiences and relevant experiences across my CV time, it was growing and scaling that company. And so the opportunity to see if we can do that again, and I entered this company roughly at the same time and dollar size that I entered that company, that was just a, a, a neat thing. And then when you also have the chance to look of look into what, what Castle is about, which uh, has a strong base of focus on innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, customers and customer relationships and talent, it, you know, you kind of pull me aside. Those are the things that I think what makes for great companies. And so having, values resonance in an opportunity to grow and scale a business that really is not yet untapped uh, its full potential i thought that that would have been a really cool thing and then as you know now we know going backwards that this industry is going through so much change and i, I don't know that i would have appreciated it at the time looking forward that there would be as much change as we're seeing today uh, but through the middle of all that change comes a lot of uncertainty comes a lot of challenge for the industry for our customers and that's when they need help. And so that has made that, I think, even more interesting uh, during this last couple of years. So let's dig into that a little bit, because it's, it's interesting that you brought that up. I guess the pandemic, you, you joined, I believe, Castle in 2018, right? It's so about five yeah, years Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so 18 months roughly into your time at Castle, you know, COVID hits. I imagine it must have been incredibly disruptive. Take me through that experience. Like, what did that feel like as uh, in your in your second year of being CEO? Well, I know, I know, Rob, you've, you've had your share of that. Uh, that like everything gets pulled out from under you, and and all. I think we all remember the time we had individually or personally when we didn't know what was going on, right, with the world, and uh, we had you know we like wiped down all the pizza boxes and everything. <laughs> I still remember that day, and then I think I think in business. Uh, of course, it's it's a place that maybe a bunch of us have walked out or maybe it feels like eons ago. And uh, I remember we, we did this one um, castle-wide, company-wide uh, webinar teleconference. And somebody asked this question, uh, Handel, can we die from this? And it, it's, a, it's a super weird question, right, to take it in front of your, the entire company and like, sure. I'm not out there, right, so I can't answer that question. But it was it was what was happening through the mind of people is we had to keep our business running. We had to keep our clients premises safe 
And so then we had to deploy our technicians as much as we pull people out to go home like most of the world did. We had people who are still manning the phones or you know, personing the phones, handling the phone calls, the inbound traffic, handling customer requests, deploying technicians to go and fix it. Technicians had to go out and push all the buttons that nobody wanted to touch. All that stuff was happening. And, and so it was a, a hard set of things to deal with from a what do we do with our business standpoint, but also what do we do with people and making them feel safe in doing what they needed to do to fulfill the customer promise, which I think all in all ended up being hard. And 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 I, I think for us, I, I remember we went through in the very early stage, as most people probably did, is they uh, did their share of, uh, you know, um, layoffs and furloughs, which we did in the beginning because we just didn't know what was going to happen. And then I also remember a moment where I was like, gosh, we start to look really inward rather than outward in a moment when you shouldn't be looking so inward, but it's human nature to do it when everybody's just hunkered down trying to figure out how you get through the next set of stuff. And then you get through the furloughs and layoffs and all that kind of stuff. What, what happens? And I, I said, gosh, we need to go and, uh, and look out and play offense a little bit. Um, this is such a horrible thing to say, but uh, maybe I'll say it. It's like we look back on the time and uh, COVID ended up being for, for us a great thing to have happened. Certainly, like it's a bad thing for the world, so there's no, none, of, none of that. But we ended up in Castle stepping up our innovation agenda. So we really started to activate muscles that we've had in our company for a long time. But just to, to uh, maybe even take advantage of that even more, we came up with a framework that we called Castle Safe Spaces which was about all the two uh, technologies that you could deploy, like the uh, touchless access, touchless elevators that we had uh, created um, and put in place because of who we are and what we could do to, to do some fast innovation there, some health screening questions and technologies that link to your access control system so you couldn't get in if you weren't uh, cleared. There are a bunch of things that we took to market really quickly that I thought was great because it allowed us to play offense and and we didn't know what was going to stick but it allowed us to do stuff that i think at the time again to my comment earlier that there was so much uncertainty that we started to have conversations with a lot of leading companies that maybe before we weren't having access to because we brought them a point of view about what was going on and maybe a new way to tackle the problem which i think was really great for us and it was so important all of a sudden right top of the agenda and you know, it's interesting the way you frame that. And, and I love the way you took it, because if I think back even to the story, you know, and I appreciate you sharing such a personal anecdote about you know, what your, your employees were going through, and what that felt like at the beginning of COVID. But there's a there's a view of this that could have been more oppositional, right? Like Castle is uh, building a business that is dependent on people being in offices and going through offices, and that could feel oppositional with what's happening in COVID. And there's a totally different angle, as you described, which is much more innovation oriented. So, okay, how do we evolve our business to be able to, to be supportive of customers during this time? It sounds like that second path was a really fruitful path for you in terms of the way you approached it. Yeah, it, it's for sure. And, and you never know going into it what's actually going to happen. Uh, the, the good thing about our business is whether people are in the office or not in the office, people still need us, right? So if there's nobody in the office, do they, uh, they feel like the premises are secured? We have all sorts of problems with the lack of downtown security and a lot of other, uh, you know, riots and things that were happening. And so is my space secured? So that gives us an opportunity. But then there's also the part of um, people wanting people to feel safe coming back to the office when they did. And they didn't feel safe with the current set of back then current set of technology for which we could come in and do something different. And that innovation helped them too. And so in, I think in all of the challenges that any industry, any company, any whatever faces, you always have opportunity to think different, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I love that story too. One thing that's interesting, and maybe as a byproduct of some of the work handle that you were describing that you did from an innovation perspective, uh, you came up with the workplace occupancy barometer right at Castle, uh, which has since become in many ways one of the, the most reputable or recognizable data sets on where we're at in return to office relative to, to beforehand. I'd love to dig into that a little bit. How did that come up? Was it, did it come out of an internal need or were you thinking about that data from a, from a thought leadership perspective? Yeah, I, I have to give our team a lot of credit for this uh, because it, it's it's data that we sit on and we've we've always known for a long time. So we have a 
cloud-based access control system that allows us to to aggregate and centralize a lot of the data collection to us in the cloud um, and again centrally um, so we can pull data and see what our customers were doing and, and i don't know that we fully appreciated what we had or what we knew that the clients didn't uh, knew or didn't know and so we could see how many people were entering the buildings and how many how many people were badging in basically right um, so, so we thought we had something that was going to be really helpful to the broader real estate community. And so we, we, we ran this, this data internally and, and so funny to go back in time, uh, cause we never thought it was going to take off in the way that it did. Right. So we even had our own. I was response. curious if that was part of the hypothesis or if it came more organically. It was way, way, way more organic than that. Cause we, we had debate internally about whether any of this stuff was going to be useful to clients. Right. And, and I remember there was one meeting in particular where we're like, gosh, I mean, they, they, they gotta be pulling this data themselves. Why wouldn't they be pulling it? And so we show up with a, a one company version of this. So, so across their, you know, X of the X buildings, instead of across the thousands of buildings, but across these X of the X buildings, like here's your data. And they thought it was the most amazing thing. And some of us were like, wait a minute, don't you just have this to yourself? Cause you could easily pull it from our system, but they didn't. And, and I, I think to, to now having that as a data set or data asset, the, uh, the next, I think, set of credit, uh, the, the bit of credit goes to our communications agency, our PR agency, so subject matter is the company. And, and they, they, they helped us to, to name it. So Barometer, I think, is a really cool name. And then pushed it to a lot of the major publications. And now it's become, as you're saying, it's, it's like the benchmark, right? So back to the office, what kind of, People are coming back. How many people come back? The data shows up regularly. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Wall Street, uh, Washington Post, Bloomberg, et cetera. And it's really great. It's really great. But we had literally no idea this was going to take off as much as it did. So, so it sounds like, if I'm understanding correctly, that this is, it wasn't a new, a new pursuit, so to speak, in terms of capturing this data and then analyzing it. This is stuff that you are already looking at on a regular basis and actually just effectively putting it on a scale relative to where it was beforehand and, and then sharing that publicly, all of a sudden you, you, you tapped an opportunity that maybe just wasn't so self-evident ahead of time. Yeah, it, it is. We had the data, we collect the data. I don't know that we would have packaged or synthesized the data in the same way. The 10 off, sorry, 10 office, 10 city barometer, I think is a really cool way to capture what's going on in the central business districts of each city. So I think that notion packaged in the noun of a barometer is really cool, but we did, we did have it. And, and so we just said, Hey, let's get this out there and see what we can do with it. And I, I would also give Mark Ein, again, the, the owner, a lot of credit here is that I think this is going to be so powerful. If we activated it with a great agency, uh, we can get this everywhere. And we did and it did and it worked out great. Yeah, I think it's become, you know, and you and I first chatted, uh, you know, a few months ago from a data perspective around different data sets. And, and in my opinion, I think it's become between the, the data that Castle puts together here on what's actually happening in return to office relative to pre-pandemic, uh, the data that you know, Nick Bloom and others at WFH Research put together on employee and employer surveys on what they're looking for in terms of day spent in office and how that's trending. And the data that we do at Flex Index on policy and how that's evolving, I think it's a it's without each of those pieces, it's hard to stitch together a complete view of what's going on. But we rely on that Castle data pretty heavily to get a sense of okay, well, where are we in this in this cycle? Yeah, and, and props to you guys for that because I, I think it's it, they're different pieces of the elephant in some way, right? And so I think uh, in in the world of uh, you know lacking a dearth of information to be able to make real decisions or good decisions, you want to come up with as many perspectives that you can synthesize, synthesize together as you can. And we are fortunate to be sitting on this data asset and married with yours and, and uh, Nick Bloom's, of course, I think that gives you a more rounded view. I think there are probably are other perspectives that you can bring in. And these are hard decisions and choices that people and, and companies and buildings, uh, real estate people have to make without a lot of information. So the more you know, the more you know. Was there a, a first media hit or early story that you remember that felt like it really uh, opened up this as a data set or kind of made journalists recognize the opportunity and being able to look at this on a regular basis? I think, I think the first one, I remember a Wall Street Journal article and then I remember a New York Times article and I can't remember what, I think the first one went after Castle Safe Spaces, like just 
probably I'm going to make up a date like June ish, July ish timeframe in 2020 when, because we, we, we only thought this was going to last a month, right? At that, <laughs> at that point. And so, so you have to get it pretty fast, right? Because if it was going to be valuable, it had to go. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I remember there was an article that was like, what are you talking about? Castle City Spaces and what are the technologies that are available to get people back in the office? And then we started to push out. And I, I remember distinctly the, the 20% because, you know, you, you drop down from 2020 down into the teens and you're starting to back up into the 20s and mid-teens. And then it was going to be like 80 next year, like soon or not even next year, like three months from now. And so there, there was a, I think that was a Wall Street Journal article then that started to capture this or New York Times again. I'm not exactly sure, but it started to say, oh, yeah, this is a number that we're tracking and we're watching. And, and it's just, it just starts to snowball and pick up, right? Because they find this data, they're like, hey, this is interesting. And then the people start to write about it all in context of what the broader business community is asking about is how useful are the buildings? And when are people coming back? What's going to be the future of work? And then they need to punctuate that with some information, some data. And as it happened, that ours was the one that was available. And then the more you write, the more you pull from Castle data, the more you keep swirling around in it. And then the more that it gets referenced and self-referenced and cross-referenced, and then it becomes now a standard, which I think is just the way that organically these kinds of things take off. It, you know, it's a great case study in that sense for any company that is thinking about how do you build a thought leadership or kind of like a data leadership position in your respective industry, right? And thinking about the data you capture, what does it mean to expose that in the right way? And look, not all data sets are as interesting as others, right? But it's a pretty good, it, it's made Castle, at least in future of work, a household name. You know, Castle already had great brand recognition, uh, but in a way that maybe is a, is a different uh, trajectory or kind of like a different scale than, than would have been otherwise, maybe without it. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. I, I, I feel like you uh, th there's there is intention to it, and then there's a lot of luck, right? And and the intention to it is, uh, does it tie to something that's relevant? And then does it really support decisions that somebody's trying to make? Because otherwise, it doesn't, you know, data for data's sake doesn't mean anything. Totally. And, and that's probably one of my bigger lessons learned back thinking about CEV days is you're, you're, you're supporting some set of decisions. What is that? And I think this just ended up being the right thing at the right time for a lot of what were really important decisions that people are trying to make without a lot of information to go make it. Has it changed anything about the way you think about Castle strategy in terms of the role of data or have you thought about commercializing data differently uh, or has it more been just a, a kind of like a media and thought leadership and, and client engagement piece? Uh, well, data has always been a thing. It's probably even been become, well, for sure, has become more of a thing for us maybe more recently with with some of the data that work that we have been doing with the barometer. But um, our, our chief product officer, Todd Berner, also comes from CEB, so there's a lot about data and data initiatives and decision support that maybe we grew up thinking about. And and so data as it informs real decisions taking so so if you step back the barometer is is what we never thought to sell it, right? That was not the thing because it was a a good I think that we could provide to the community that was going to be helpful to them at that level. As we started to think about taking advantage of the, that idea and to go to a much more uh, focused or maybe concentrated set of data that can be about a real estate portfolio or it could be specifically to a building and how its spaces is being used or not being used, that then drives to kinds of things like um, lease risk, how much risk do I have in my lease base? Or uh, how should I run my maintenance program, my operations program, my HVAC to line up with when people are in the building? Those kinds of questions end up being real uh, P&L questions that improve your top line. You can lease better, more efficiently or whatever, or you can run your space with more cost efficiency. You make money doing it. And so as we've been pushing ourselves to think about that, the evolution of it is even being more specific on the data being more data, uh, sorry, more decision support driven, more focused on what is it that's going to help people, our clients make more money. I think that's probably more recently what we've been pushing to. 
Got it. So if I understand correctly, it sounds like less focus on commercialization at the macro in terms of data availability or making it available in terms of what's happening across 10 metros or the US. Uh, but as that pertains to a particular real estate portfolio or building and how that impacts decision making for clients, that has been valuable and in, in ways kind of unlocks different levels of value in the way that you interact with some of your customers. Yeah, I, I feel like we have maybe now a more, a more of a right to play than we had before because we're known to be those barometer people or those data people. And so then what may have been a, an access control company that's really largely about getting in and out of doors, now we have different kind of value add. And so then getting through to that in, in terms of product offering, yes, at a micro or a specific level. At the macro level, we just hope to be able to you know help the community. I think that's a good thing. And certainly that has helped our brand to your comment uh, earlier which is not a bad thing, but that was not what we were looking to go into do. Makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about, we talked a lot about the barometer and kind of how it evolved and, and, and some of the thinking around that. I'm curious what your take is on, on the latest results, you know, and as I looked in, in some of the data in August, you know, it, and there's been a lot of discussion in the media around this, around kind of hitting the 50% mark in terms of return relative to pre-pandemic. I think the last few weeks, it's been like in the 47, 48 range, but Maybe not that surprising given as you think about where, what kind of like late summer type trends summer. are. And so how are you thinking about what it's showing and, and do you have a sense or, or kind of instinct on where we might be headed over the coming months? Yeah. So, uh, so, so it, it's, it's settled in at this 40, 50, and I think summer has a lot to do with the 40 rather than it, it crested over 50 and then it fell back down. Um, it, so hard to predict, right? I, 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 I do a, a different press and they always ask me to predict and I'm like, if, if I could predict, then I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> so, um, but the, the, so the, the thing that I have found in, in, I don't know what it feels like to, uh, for you, Rob, but for, for us at Castle or for, for my friends or my clients who run companies, I think we generally want people back in the office and it feels like it's an important thing that's been missing uh, for how all the studies have been done about productivity and all that, which I, I, I know is true, but there's also attachment and engagement to people in the company or to the company itself or to how people collaborate, how people innovate that are the softer parts of that. And so I believe were it not for maybe um, peer differences or peer differences that uh, uh, peer pressure for how others may or may not be getting people back in work for not for were it not for um, job competition, you know, reasons, maybe more people might be back in the office. I'm, I'm not sure. So there's always give and take to it. But I feel like it is generally the sense that as we hear about it, and my hope, uh, or my hope, my expectation is that we're going to see some tick up now in into the fall that people are going to start coming back. The, the thing that you're also seeing, I think, if you look underneath the data, if you look at the Tuesdays and Wednesdays, which is when the days really hit and the peaker, uh, the more peak days in the week versus the Fridays. So Fridays, there's a lot of, of press has been written about how Fridays are dead. And so you get this disparity between the Tuesday, Wednesday peaks, and they might inch up higher. And then the Fridays all being low, maybe Mondays being low, which averages to a number that doesn't take up as fast, but it's masking some uh, growth in that. And so there is a 30 uh, point, I think, disparity between New York peak at 52 or something percent and on a Friday low at 20 percent. And then the average number, which averages at 50, uh, ends up splitting a 55 or 56 percent number, if I remember right, versus a 30 percent. So we're going to see it, I think, but it might just be masking in this average. My guess is it starts getting I expect into the seventies at some point in time. I don't know that we'll ever get back to hundred because I think the seventies on a peak day or seventies, you think on an average relative to pre pandemic I think it'll get to that. I mean, like, we'll see, like, I think it'll get to that on, on some average. I don't know if it'll come back to hundred, but I feel like the, uh, the peak days will probably get even more peak than 70, but I will see if it gets to the average of the sixties or seventies, just given how much uh, interest and momentum is to get people back and to, recapture what a bunch of us feel like we're missing, it'll be great to see uh, if that uh, plays out that way. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say it because we're looking at the looking at the data too in the same way that you are and we find the same things, right? In terms of the Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday being the, the biggest peaks and 
you know, from a policy perspective for companies that require specific days per week in the office, and we're actually just looking at this for the Fortune 500 right now, I think it's 70 plus percent of uh, companies that have specific days. It's Tuesday and Wednesday are the highest and followed by Thursday. But in the Fortune 500, for example, I think Monday was 13% of companies required and Friday was 4%, mm. which is pretty mind boggling, 4%, yeah. right? And so the big question for me is not whether those Tuesday, Wednesday peaks get higher. I think they will. You know, I think most companies are probably going to end up with some middle of the week you know, type of attendance. But are we far enough gone on Monday and Friday that you actually start to see this it basically is a shortened work week in the office? And is there enough incremental benefit in getting people together four days versus three days or five days versus four days that companies are willing to push that far, you know, mm -hmm. relative to the, the feedback on flexibility that might be coming from the employee base around that experience? Yeah, it's a super interesting question because I, th I think from a commercial real estate standpoint, like three days is the worst number of or best, I guess, to commercial real estate, worst maybe from an employer standpoint, number of days in the office because you can't redesign your footprint really off of three days a week. If everybody's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're just going to need the same amount of space. I think the, the interesting question would be how collaboration works or the future of work works in this environment and when people come in. And so Mondays and Fridays are dead for personal reasons or people wanting to you know, have extended weekends kind of reasons, but it really depends on whether you can make it productive while they're there. And so if, if none of your colleagues are going to be there on a Friday or Monday, then why would you go in ever? So how do you, how do you organize the, the Tetris game of slotting people together so that the people you need to work with are all going to be in there at the same time to maximize your collaboration time? I think that's a question that, we should be asking ourselves or thinking about right now and how to enable that to be so. And I think it's a very different way of working if you start to think about it that way. It's not the old fashioned way. It just happens to be the days that we're managing to be in the office. It's the next evolution of how work logistically works or what happens inside of the space that you wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great framing. In some ways it's shifting from the what to the how, right? Like we're not talking about, okay, well, what's the number of days in the office? We're talking about, okay, well, if we're in a world that's hybrid, you know, and, and I think we, we believe pretty strongly, you know, at, at least at, at Scoop and Flex Index that we're in a hybrid world on a go forward basis. I think you'd, you'd probably feel similarly. Uh, but if we're going to be there, what, what's required to actually enable that? And I think that's the conversation that probably has has fallen secondary, it feels like in some ways behind the, okay, well, how much time are we going to be spending in the office? And now starts to become important around, well, how do we get people to collaborate and connect? And what does it mean to get people together at the right times? And my instinct is that's going to become more and more part of the discourse, you know, over the coming months. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I, I feel like you, you, you find us all in the one step at a time. And you take the one step and, and it may or may not be immediately fulfilling for people to come in because they, they feel like they're, they're mandated to come in. Maybe what you're, you're talking about before the Fortune 500, I'm mandated to come in. So I feel like I have to, if, if you take it at some face value that people want to do a good job and want to do good work, and I want to maximize the time or maximize the return on the time that I've invested against work. So is that better in the office is better at home. It's only better in the office if I can dot, dot, dot. And what does that look like? And how is it clunky or not clunky for me to have that experience while in the office? Is that better or worse than at home? And all of those are questions that I think will be the questions that we have to answer next because people will naturally have that, you know, unfulfilling experience where they complain, why do I have to come in? If all I'm just going to do is get on the call and do 2D with people at home and then they'll complain and then we'll have to go and work it out. But I think those are the next set of questions that people will be wrestling with. I think that's right. And I think the other part that makes it extra complicated is the answer for an individual on whether or not their most productive hours are spent in the office to the point that you're raising uh, can vary tremendously based on seniority, function, introversion, extroversion, other responsibilities. In fact, it might be different for me this year than next year. You and I were just talking about how the fact that I have you know, a second kid uh, coming on the way, right? And like that may look very different when I have a, you know, an infant at home versus a one-year-old versus a two-year-old in terms of where I can be most productive. And, and that creates some complexity with the desire to be simple in policy and uniformly apply that across an organization. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, maybe, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say that all corporates are too lazy, but I think right now we just have to take step one and it's like everybody in the office. And then you just have to figure out exactly how and what makes the most sense. And, and, and I think it refines and iterates from yeah, and I think one of the things that we've been finding that that I think is starting to become in some ways a good happy medium too is an increasing prevalence of 
minimum days per week policy, which, yeah. which I often think about as this is a, maybe a crappy analogy, but I, I kind of think about it as like a, a, a bowling lane with like bumper rails on it, where the company is basically saying, okay, we want everyone to kind of be in this, you know, two ish to three days range. And then we'll leave it up to a team or function to customize that a little bit based on, you know, their particular needs, the individuals who they operate with cross functionally. And, and I do think maybe that creates some decent, happy medium between desire for people to collaborate, but also customization at the end. At kind of like at the at the at the front line, so to speak, in order to make that work a little bit better. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. I, I think the the medium to me between uh, there's an organic like people will feel more engaged if they feel like they have say. Right, I have agency. I can think about why I should be in the office and what's optimum for me and my team. Right, so there's that. But then there there there's another one. I think the other side of the coin is there probably needs to be some prescription around it because somebody or some you know, leaders will lift above the group or the function or the company's whatever ambition to say, you know what, at this time I need these people together because I can get the best connection points or the best innovation points or collaboration points because these groups are working together and it happens that it's this these days or Tuesdays or whatever it is. And so how do you figure out what the right balance is that gets you to the top-down, if you will, perspective, balanced by agency, the word I used, or some level of flexibility to accommodate whatever the local person, team, group needs to do, and then we'll work it out. I think that's right. Maybe one question more macro I'm curious your perspective on. Does, how does it look different for Castle's business? If, if we're, let's say, for example, if we're in, let's say we end up in 50s versus pre-pandemic, you know, versus 60s versus 70s, as you described. Does that have dramatically different implications for how Castle operates, or are you somewhat agnostic to what that exact end state level ends up being? Maybe like, uh, maybe to the comment I made earlier, uh, every company in ours, uh, of course included in that, has a reason to exist depending on what outcome it is somebody is managing to. And so in the world of everybody in the office, access control certainly matters and there's a lot of enablement for everybody in the office for the kind of experience that a building might want to have or an employer might want to have. If everybody out of the office, then you've got a security thing that you have to provide for, for people not being in the office and what happens when, uh, when people aren't there and aren't watching because part of what you get by people being in the office is you're every day somebody's vigilant over something and you need electronic eyes if you don't have physical eyes on something. And, and so it isn't so much that it impacts the business directly in terms of a business sense, but it's more like, what do we do to help our clients achieve whatever outcome they're trying to achieve, given whatever the, the, the context is. And, and I, I think for Castle, what has been really a privilege for us is access control sits in the middle and, and, and video sits in the middle of so many, whether it's experience or security needs that our clients have that enables again, better experience, better returns on your money, more cost and operating efficiencies. We can sit in the middle with whatever the technologies that we've got or the technologies that we've got to enable whatever outcomes that people are looking for. It's just a matter of figuring out how to appropriately respond. So it might be product mix and even messaging and kind of like prioritization might look a little bit different, but those, those the underlying need around security and safety doesn't really change that much, it sounds like. Relative yeah, to the I think that's what we're seeing. That's what we're feeling as well. Got it. Uh, any uh, final thoughts on this topic or where we might be headed, prognostications that you've wanted to make that you haven't done yet? would love to hear if there's anything else on your mind here. No, I, I, think, I think we talked about it all. I, I, I feel like the, the thing that may be most interesting for me is uh, as a leader and how I run, we collectively run Castle and how we think about collaboration, ideation, engagement with the company, which is a set of uh, balancing, as you said, uh, flexible work with uh, being in the office and how then we think about that set of needs for clients that are going through the same set of questions and challenges themselves. Um, and I get to play both roles a bit of like, what do we create the product is to serve companies like us on the buying side, but then we all have to also make decisions that make sense for us on the delivery side to make us have great companies. And, and I, I think sometimes we forget, like we have to have great people and great companies first. And if we have great people and great companies, then we can typically figure out how to solve the customer problem as long as we get that formula uh, correct. 
Do you feel the need then to be in office more out of, out of your own personal kind of like belief or leadership style in terms of what you think leads to kind of like best team productivity or best company, uh, or out of what you do from a castle perspective, does that drive a, a need or desire to be in the office more? Um, because what that means are going to market and the company broadly. Yeah, I, I, I lean to what I think companies need to do first. But I also know that throughout pandemic, most of Castle was here because we were serving a client base that was in their office because their our clients are, you know, uh, real estate uh, owners and operators, and that was their products. And so we need understood we need to understand how they are thinking. And so we were in the office because they're in the office. Um, but I, I, I go back to what I was saying before. It's like I feel like in order to do great things with a great company, great people who are engaged and doing great stuff. And so we start with that, which is a disposition I have for how we strike the right balance between uh, remote and, and, and in office work. And then how we manifest and, and turn that energy into something that's productive for our clients. I think that's the uh, great question. Yeah. It sounds like it's been a, a fascinating five years, you know, at Castle, probably more than you bargained for. And in some ways, probably very motivating and engaging also in terms of the types of things that you've experienced. For sure. Uh, yes. For sure. Lucky to have the opportunity. That's awesome. Uh, so one thing we always do, Haniel, as I mentioned at the beginning, was we, we always do a rapid fire just to people get to know you a little bit more personally outside of what you do. Are you OK if I ask you a few questions? Yeah, yeah, please. All right, cool. Um, what was your very first job? Uh, so I was a, an errand boy of some sort and quasi receptionist at, uh, at a computer supply trading company in Hong Kong, actually, when I was in late middle school. Aaron Boy, quasi receptionist, is a job I have not heard before. That's well, a... it, it's just like, <laughs> hey, can you pick up the phone? <laughs> it's like that. It was exactly like that. Somebody to do things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is the best book you've read lately? Uh, uh, so I'm in the middle of this really interesting book uh, called Antifragile. Have you come across this book? This is the uh, Talib. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Nicholas Nassim Talib. Uh, Nicholas Talib. Anyway. I've not read it, but it's funny that you mention it because the term anti fragile was coming. It was coming to mind, by the way, as you were talking about how you know if return to office is higher, then we focus more on you know the kind of like this messaging within product, and if it's lower, then these pieces. And it made me think about being anti fragile as an organization in some ways. Yeah, it's like pe go through chaos is is one of the the principal ideas of that thing. And and I, I, I like what systems work better when things are not a system or when things are going through change. I think that that's a it's, it sort of speaks to where we are now. I'm I'm very early in the book, so I'm uh, it's it's good. Yeah, it sounds super interesting. Um, is there a show or a movie that you are obsessed with right now? Uh, there isn't one right now, but. This will go to my personality a lot. You know, a movie that I love watching over and over again is the Lego Batman movie. <laughs> why? Why do you love the Lego Batman movie? It's it's so clever. It is so clever because there's so many like kid level jokes and then adult level jokes in that. I just, I think it's great. And then I uh, I also just between uh, CD and Castle. I'll send this to you, but I built a life-size Lego Batman statue. Oh, that's amazing. Please do. <laughs> so I will send that to you. I feel like this has been the brilliance of like animation and movies that have come out over the last however many years is the ability to balance audience and both nail the kid, but also oh. the adult thinks is clever and the jokes land at a different level is um, it's a stroke of brilliance. For sure. Um, when you are in the office, what's your favorite snack? Uh, we do donuts in the office every Monday. Uh, and Sounds dangerous. Well, it is, and this is what I do. I, I I cut a quarter of it. I leave the three quarters in the box. I'll eat the one quarter, and then I'll go back and I'll cut another quarter so that a half is left. Uh, it is totally a bad, dangerous thing to have. That sounds fantastic, though. Um, who is one future of work uh, thinker or writer that you really respect? This is biased to my old company, to CEB, to Gartner. They do really great work to me on future work. So. It's been a topic forever for since I was there a long time ago, and they continue to do great work now. So awesome. I encourage everybody to go there. And one last question for anybody listening who wants to learn more about you or read more about you and the work you're doing, where should they go? Uh, thanks so much for asking. Uh, so we are at castle with a K, uh, dot com, K-A-S-T-L-E dot com. 
Um, we post a barometer there. So if you wanted to receive the weekly update on what the number is, you can sign up for that. And then you can generally see the, uh, the capabilities that we've got, the products that we've got, all the different perspectives that we have of what's going on in the world. You can find it there. Awesome. Daniel, it's such a pleasure to do this. I find you incredibly thoughtful and intentional about the way that you approach some of these topics and uh, the contribution that you've made to the broader community, as you mentioned, when it comes to data and understanding where we're at relative to pre-pandemic is incredibly helpful. And so uh, thanks for taking the time and thanks for everything that you do. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all the work that you're doing as well. I really appreciate it and really appreciate the opportunity here. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Please also consider giving us a rating or leaving a review as that helps other listeners find the podcast. For more Flex Index content, including past episodes, our Flex Index newsletter, and monthly research reports, visit flex.scoopforwork.com. See you next time.